Everyday Anarchism. My guest today is Philip Ording, the author of the book, 99 Variations on a Proof, although the book starts at zero, doesn't it? Doesn't it, it does. Philip? Doesn't it does. that make it 100? I guess I'm, I'm going to jump right in here. Isn't it 100 variations on a proof? I think that that has to do with what legitimacy you give zero as a number. But yeah, I will I will grant you, Graham, that you're counting correctly. What legitimacy you give zero as a number. Um, so the reason why I have invited Philip on the show today um, is because his book, 99 Variations on a Proof, or 100 Variations on a Proof, as I'm going to subtitle it uh, from here on in, is it, it, it's the same um, equation proven or you know the, the the solution or the two solutions to it proven in two different ways or the the two different solutions proven in these 99 or 100 different ways some of which are frankly uh from my point of view outrageous uh, or at least don't seem mathematical so for this uh, for this show in fact i've met but i don't seem mathematical i mean they seem cultural um historical political artistic so for this show, what I've called epistemological anarchism, sometimes just called pragmatism, the idea that uh, there are not platonic eternal truths out there that structure everything in the same way that there's not some sort of uh, eternal governmental truth of authority. As soon as I saw this book, I was like, oh, this is a way of thinking about math that will get me away from some of the bad and platonic ways that I have seen math thought about and talked about and and taught. So that's why uh, that's why I invited you on the show, Philip. And I now I just have to say the book is the book is fantastic. I will admit I failed to read it cover to cover. At some point I had to give up and I had to start flipping through it instead. I probably have looked at all 100 or 99 of the proofs, but uh, it's a fantastic achievement. Thank you so much for for writing this book. Oh, thank you for thank you for that. And thanks for having me. I think um, you know, I, I think in my response when we were corresponding about it, I, I mentioned that, you know, I, I grew up in a family where we had the custom of dinner table conversation about ideas. Um, both my parents are deeply curious and uh, widely read. And, and at the time, my father, most of the years I was growing up, was a graduate student in comp lit. Uh, so it actually means a lot to me that the book would be finding an audience in you um, that's you know thinking about the history of ideas uh, and and in this broader context um, also just by invite having me on everyday anarchism i think that my credibility with my students at sarah lawrence is probably <laughs> going up by a, a factor of 10 um, so i'm i'm glad to be here Kids, kids these days do seem to be kind of into anarchism, but I'm not sure if they're into academic podcasts. So you might, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm afraid there isn't an everyday anarchism TikTok. So that that that's what would give you credibility with your students if you were on TikTok. Um, You're prob probably right. I'm, I'm not on TikTok clearly. <laughs> yes, no, no. We are we are both not on TikTok here. Um, so I. I guess to go back, and this is again something that we've been talking about and corresponding about before, the, the first thing to say, and this is something that comes up all the time in the work of John Dewey and Peter Kropotkin and these theorists, is everything, <laughs> when you are searching for truth, at least from the, from the epistemological perspective, ugh, I shouldn't use that word, when you're searching for truth in the way I like to search for it, everything comes with a, a history. And the first big mistake to make is sort of the mistake Descartes says, where he says, I'm going to erase everything and start with first principles. And I'm guessing a, a lay person would think that that's probably how, how math works. Let's erase everything and start with first principles. But your book, all of the proofs are in one way or another, even the ones that look ahistorical to us, embedded in history. And I thought that really revealed the sort of to use a cliche term, socially constructed nature of math. So what can you tell us about how, how history has made math, if that's a claim that makes sense? I think that that's my experience of it as well. I, I should say, though, I mean, when I started out, like a lot of people attracted to mathematics, it was, it was the certainty. It was the fact that you can learn mathematics in an environment that's not dogmatic, um, that does not appeal to authority, that um, 
in which you, it's expected that you can ask a question at any point and somebody should be able to justify their claim. I don't know that that happens, that that's the, you know, the way that mathematics actually operates, but there is the, that, at least that ideal when working. So um, I, was I was attracted to the kind of timelessness of mathematics when I started out, but the, once you uh, take any kind of advanced work, you're immediately confronted with um, the strangeness of definitions in mathematics. There's so many, there's so much fine print, there's so many um, little uh, uh, exceptions that are thrown in that you wonder, what is it? Why can't we just talk about what a, what a triangle is? Or why do we have to <laughs> suddenly say, well, we mean, a, we mean a triangle in the plane, or we mean a triangle in the Euclidean plane? Or we, in fact, we, you know, why do these things crop crop in? And um, for me, the the place that I really saw that was in this book called Proofs and Refutations by Imre Lakatos, and he traces the history of one idea, um, basically a solid, like what is the idea of a solid or a polyhedron, something with with faces that are flat, and um, it seems like an intuitive idea, but it really it, there were real battles over it, and he traces the whole history, but he does it in this imaginative way. The actual history is in the footnotes, and the 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 main text is this classroom that's uh, kind of duking it out on what they think uh, the object should be and what it is and what it isn't. Um, and that was a way in for me, anyway, to think about how I could I could put together and present something to people that would be convincing of of why the history really matters and and that any time you are working with a concept it it comes as you said it comes with this long history but don't you think that when it's still the case when when students are taught math it is taught without history and and <laughs> precisely as you say one one of the questions that 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 cannot be asked is why do we do it why do we do it that way? Why couldn't we be solving for Y instead of solving for X all the time, which is the simplest of questions, but it seems like, I mean, you, you rarely are solving for Y. I mean, we just, it's just writing from the left side of the page versus the right side of the page in a certain way. But these, these things are just accepted, nor can I answer my students why we write from left to right, as opposed to the other cultures that answer right to left. It's like, don't ask me that. That's not a good question because I don't know how to answer it, and it's not part of my uh, the repertoire that I've been taught and can respond to. Yeah, no, I know that's right. <laughs> I think that's because most teachers at the primary, secondary level, um, and most textbooks, by the way, adopt the logical um, approach. They, you know, it's assumed that if you're going to give a logical presentation, you start with the least assumptions and you work your way up from there. This is based on the axiomatic um, method. Um, going back to the first math textbook in Euclid, I suppose, at least in the West. Um, there's there's another approach though. I mean, like the, the, the sort of earlier, um, if you want, texts of mathematical knowledge in, in China are these these books of problems where it's it's much more of a dialogue um, but because of maybe Euclid and the axiomatic uh, method, that's that's been the approach. But you're right. I mean, it, so you know, I was asking a this friend of mine that I was in graduate school, Bart Ben Sterdegem, about um, coming on this podcast. He's much more politically savvy than I am. Um, he was the one getting arrested um, in New York City at the Republican convention, um, and you know, he was saying, you know, I think a lot of mathematicians have this idea that we are anarchists, it's, that we have this spirit of being able to speak truth to power because we can, we can hold any authority accountable. Um, but in practice, it doesn't, it doesn't really happen that way. And, and I think um, we do, we really think of, we know who the authorities are in our <laughs> fields. And, and if they write a textbook, I mean, we're probably going to, use it unless it's awfully written um or at least we're going to revere it and um so yeah i think that's that's unfortunate um and that's one of the reasons i think it's it's really hard to convey the creativity of mathematics because you're working against years of experience that's telling most readers otherwise um 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I th another way of putting this is, you know, um, science as, as it's practiced by scientists can be quite anarchistic in that they, it can be free flowing. It can certainly tear down uh, received wisdom. It should be dialogic and argumentative. So we have peer review rather than, you know, a central authority figure, whereas we get things like the WHO, which famously uh, as an authority figure failed to understand things like how COVID worked. Um, but science education is not anarchistic like that at all. It is not free flowing. It is not historical. It is not based on style and, and an understanding of how history and style coincide. And it sounds like what you're telling me is it's the same thing for the mathematicians. The mathematicians know about this free flowing world of style and expression, but that when the textbook comes out, which is the thing that's going to go to the students, all of a sudden the anarchism goes away and it's back to this top down technocratic thing. Because every, everyone, one rule of thumb for anarchism is everyone wants anarchism for themselves. No one thinks they need to be bound by an oppressive structure from above. But, you know, no one wants anarchism for their students, to put it another way. Right, right. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. And I think that, um, I mean, you, there are exceptions, but I think the exceptions they come about when the, when you have people that have been exposed to the more imaginative way of doing mathematics, whether through um, a tradition of problem solving, you know, open-ended problem solving, mm -hmm. or an exposure to research, whether it's in mathematics or or another science field, uh, then there you do see some of these kind of pockets where okay outside the curriculum we're going to have a session where we we ask you a deep question and we let you have at it and and really don't try to direct where you're going i think one of the reasons that the the publishing is is the way it is in textbooks um has to do with publishing in research mathematics um the Conventions are that when you want to publish a result that you you also adhere to something that looks like the axiomatic structure. I mean, it, you would never, it's very rare that people take the time to set out and, and define new axioms. That's, that's a bigger project, but nevertheless, you start with definitions and you um, give examples and then you state a proposition and then you prove it. Um, and you see the paper as flowing in this kind of one direction. Um, that's not really good at capturing the bandwidth of communicating. Even over this, you know, single channel or multi-channel bandwidth that we're using here, um, there's things that are lost. So when you go to condense all of the, uh, the life of mathematics, the, the kind of gesturing and, and the ways that you can use material like chalk and and um, your body and, and kind of to intuit and convey things down to not only print, but a logical um, deductive um, axiomatic presentation, you're really constraining yourself. I checked and Wittgenstein does not uh, appear in the index of this book, but I've, I've started a new podcast recently about artificial intelligence, which is the work I was doing before I worked on anarchism and I'm thinking about Wittgenstein and as I was reading the book again this morning. I'm thinking about Wittgenstein and his, you know, forms of life. Uh, I, I'm wondering if that has any bearing on your work or if you've thought this or if you even know Wittgenstein's work. And then uh, I, I have more thoughts on this, but I thought I'd let you go first if you have anything to say. Um, that's a good point. I think that um Wittgenstein's work falls into generally two halves, is the way I've understood it. Okay, I'm thinking and, uh, of philosophical investigations, not Tractatus. Yeah, I, I thought that's what you meant. And in, in, in the um, dependency of philosophy and thinking on language and, and the particular ways that, that words are used. Yeah, that I think that's fair. Um, I it, Now I'm thinking that it would have been 
fun to do a kind of tractatus type ordered you know his, his, <laughs> yeah. his numbers um i well, like you know honestly, branching so system you, you could have done both you could have done a tractatus yeah. one and then yeah. and then you could have done a philosophical investigations one which would have had to have like a lion in it and somehow uh -huh. they were supposed to um figure out that x equals is it four and one or four and negative i think it's four and one um just you know ba based on the lion roars of the lion that's how that's the so yeah it's, yeah it's it's more than language though for me and my reading of wittgenstein which is very informed by stanley cavell it's not just language it's it's life that's mm -hmm. the thing that gets left out and language is this is this flurry of 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 meaning creation where humans and the world and especially humans and each other meet and in, in in that sense everything is a game this this goes back to like the idea of formalism everything mm -hmm. is sort of abstract and then there's also this sort of like we all think of ourselves in this platonic way as this thing that truly exists this essence and somehow those two things meet when we are writing a book when we're talking to someone else when we're writing uh, on a chalkboard and Wittgenstein I think, insofar as you can make sense of him in the philosophical investigations, he's suggesting precisely what you said earlier about what gets left out. Every time someone has sat down to explain how communication works, they have left out almost all of it. Because how could you render what it's like to be, oh, like I was, like 13 years old, and in a math class that you probably shouldn't have been in, I placed a little too high and was sitting there and most of the people were two grades older than me and a few were one grade older and I was terrified and I didn't understand anything. And I had to go down, you know, I had to go down a math uh, level. And that's probably has shaped my understanding of math more than anything else, that experience. It was like two class periods. Yeah. But that you, you have captured moments like this in your book, Philip. Yeah. Um, thinking about math in an MRI machine, that sort of thing. But right. those moments are not captured in other conversations about math. I'm a long way from Wittgenstein now. Sorry. Yeah, right. No, um, I think, you know, we'll have to have a follow up and we'll we'll figure out what the Wittgenstein proof <laughs> one, uh, 100 and 101 are the two versions. Um, I love that. I think for me, the that um, idea about <clears throat> the the kind of limited bandwidth of communicating mathematics by conventional um, means, publication, et cetera. That comes from uh, this essay called On Proof and Progress um, in Mathematics by William Thurston. He was uh, kind of at the forefront of the field of geometry and topology when I started um, studying mathematics. And, and he was... Um, he was a little bit criticized um, because he he took what was characterized as a kind of theoretical approach and developed large research programs um, and outlined ways to formal to make them more formal or to achieve results at a um, that were complete, um, but held off from providing those details. And there was, I mean, I don't want to go into the backstory, but there was an idea that oh, maybe. Math should have a division of labor, like physics, with between theor theoreticians and experimentalists. Um, and he pushed back against that. He said, "No, what we're doing here as mathematicians is not accruing uh, theorems. You know, that is not that's part of the the career of a mathematician. But we shouldn't mistake that for what progress in the discipline means. Progress is defined by understanding, and to the extent that we can convey that understanding meaningfully to each other." Um, and that really stuck with me and it stuck with me. And he, he gives a particular example in there of the ways that you could understand the notion of one idea in calculus, the derivative, um, through everything from a very simple notation of like velocity to something very abstract and, and contemporary. So I, I took that as a kind of template or, you know, sort of off, I felt authorized from there to <laughs> flesh out that, that idea. So, first of all, that's, I mean, that's fascinating. And that, it, I keep being carried back, though, to, to the classroom in that it, it continues to seem to me that if, if, if work like the kind of work that you're describing and the kind of work you're doing in 99 Variations is going to 
uh, is going to have any value outside of the conversations that you and I are having right now. And I'm enjoying this and consider this of great value, but I very much worry about the uh, elitist nature of this project in which I'm not trying to implicate you, but I am trying to implicate myself. How could this sort of thing, this way of thinking about math be accessible to more people? And then the flip side is it's math, although not this kind of math that denies that. Because if you say something like, oh, well, we need to get this to this, this kind of thinking to more students, you get this kind of thinking towards first graders, you're told, well, will it show up in the tests? And if it doesn't show up in the tests, then it's not going to be measured correctly. Um, so, so in other words, there's a simplistic technocratic version of thinking about math in terms of metrics that kills the sense of exploration. And I'm suggesting perhaps ironically, right, it's actually a lack of education in math exploration that has led us to this place where everything, including first graders, are professionalized into metrics. Does that make sense? And could we just start with things like this for first graders? I think I'm very much interested in that question <laughs> right now. Um, so, you know, I didn't write the book to try to change the way mathematics was done. I really, I wanted to write it to provide evidence that mathematics is as creative, imaginative, and playful as I believed it to be. Uh, and what that meant, uh, what evidence meant in that for me was something that I could put in the hands of my friends and, and family who are not mathematicians, um, but many of them are artists of one type or another, and they would know within a moment that this had the qualities that I wanted, that I saw in mathematics. And the, But the other criteria that was really important to me was that it couldn't be an ode to mathematics. Yeah. It couldn't be a piece of biography. Um, it couldn't be even a piece of art that was inspired by mathematics. It really had to be something that was not embarrassing to mathematicians. And that's, um, I now, okay, so get to, get to your question, like, you know, It was no. about 12 questions all wrapped into one, Philip. That's, that's yeah. me. Um, so the, I think, so a lot of what the, the book came out of was trying to think of uh, a way to do mathematics that was a little bit closer to art making. And there, I think there is a connection, you know, to this question of what does this say about kindergarten? You know, it, it can can the joys that that I think are in mathematics be expressed at a very at an early age, or is it is it too technical, um, or does it have to come later? And and that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, there was a we talked a little bit about since you're in the North Carolina about about Black Mountain College. Mm -hmm. And there was a mathematician there named Max Dane, who happened to also be a topologist and geometer um, like Thurston. And, and even in some interesting ways, they were similar. Um, and he was also very interested in this question of, of the relationship between art and mathematics, even before he got to Black Mountain, which was an arts-centered, Dewey-inspired kind of place um, in the 30s and 40s. Um, it closed in the in the 50s but uh he thought that there was a common root between the two um and it, it it had to do with a notion of rhythm um so he thought that there there really was a way to to convey the joys of of mathematics in the same way that you do the joys of music or of making ornament or patterns and things like that so um, that's my hunch of the way to do it, but um, yeah, it's a it's another project. It's another project. Sure, I mean certainly, especially if we're going to uh, transform all of math education across the entire world, it's it, it's another project. But the way that your the what your book suggests to me, Philip, is that in some ways it's not another project. Well, let's use the use the music example a little bit more. Um, I mean. There is not an agreement, certainly, on how to teach young people music, and there are different systems that uh, that that emphasize uh, creative 
um, exploration more and and other forms of music that are that are more drill based. Um, and as a non musician, I am I am unable to to speculate on the efficacy of of these two systems. But I also remain convinced that the 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 creativity and the joy has to come first, has to exist somewhere. And I, I, I'm convinced of that for music and I'm convinced of that for math as well. But whereas there's lots of people defending this sense of music, it seems that math in the wider world, it does not have this idea defended. Your book is one of the relatively few places that I have found this sense of play and joy and style in, in math. Precisely the way kindergartners would learn math if they were just left you know, to explore their environment and started counting and that sort of thing. Right, right. I think that's, I think it's a good analogy um, to learning, uh, learning a, a system that that is complex and that is structured. Um, there, the, the one other example I know of is, um, Keith Lockhart. I don't know if you've come across Lockhart's Lament. Um, I think you would enjoy reading it. He's a high school teacher at St. Anne's in Brooklyn, and um, he he makes his essay starts exactly from this place of saying we would never teach um, or we would never expect that uh, a, ma a musical education would um, end up by having students simply perform. Um, these exercises on the piano or on any instrument. Um, it, is a, it is a process that we hope leads to them making music, which is a, something that's lived and experienced, like you said, in, um, in real time. And so I think that, you know, what is the, what is the alternative? Um, you know, I think with my book, one of the things that I kind of, confronted was in in writing it is that there are a lot of pressures on mathematics um, despite the fact that that it has a lot of freedom in defining its own problems um, it's not like it's happening outside of our society and outside of outside of math and outside of you know basic science there there is a lot of hierarchy. Um, there is a lot of division of labor. And, you know, I was thinking about this when I was, when I knew I was gonna talk to you about why it is that most of the students I went to graduate school did not choose their own research pro problem. That, mm -hmm. that was really surprising to me. I, when I got to, um, maybe because my, my dad was a, a lapsed complete PhD um, or something, but uh, I had this sense that you read a lot of things and you found out what was going on and you, you, you chose a problem that was, you thought was meaningful and then you went at it. Um, that's a really reckless way to do mathematics. Um, you can pick a really hard problem as I did that has been, people have been working on for a long time and get nowhere in the space <laughs> of four years or five or six years. Um, so I understand, you know, why the kind of apprentice system, which is what most, I think, math PhDs experience, um, where you, you choose your field and then you, you work with an advisor closely who's going to guide you. Um, but I found that really deeply disappointing. Um, and uh, um, so I'm, I'm getting a little off topic, but I think that part of the, you know, any kind of vision for what mathematics education might become is is going to have to contend with why are we teaching mathematics at all and i don't think there's anything like consensus on that and i think unfortunately the minority <laughs> is uh the minority believes what you're saying that it's that it you should learn mathematics because it's joyful and it's part of the the cultural heritage um that you and and other other cultures around the world have share 
Okay. For, first, I need to say for the listeners, I'm recording near a window and the cicadas are out in the North Carolina summer. Mm. I don't know how clear they are to you, Philip. They're very clear to me. I don't know if the mic is picking them up or not, but if you're hearing cicadas, listener, uh, they, they are real, but they're not necessarily around you. They're around me. Um, I, I don't hear it. Okay. So. <laughs> I mean, for two things in response to what you just said in terms of math education. The first thing is to say that in this in this respect, that it is a minority who believes that it should be a joyful process of discovery. Well, that applies not just to math, but to, but to everything. And I think there's probably lots of MFA students in literature and visual art who feel much like these math PhDs you're describing, that they are not on a joyful uh, road of discovery, but that they have a a, a mentor who is is more like a master in a workshop who is pointing them a certain way. I certainly know people who have had that experience. Um, so that's a that's a problem that goes far beyond math. But I turn around. Do, do you know the work of Kathy O'Neill? I do. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I had her on the show a few months ago, and we talked about that math math is supreme in this in this society. So you say that math is not separate from our society. This goes back to the, the thing about test scores that I said before. I agree with that. But if you argue from a humanistic basis against the way our society is structured, and I taught for seven years at St high school STEM Academy, so I have had this argument multiple times, math uh, is, or you know, statistics at least, is what is explained to you why the world cannot be different. The world is this way because of these numbers. Um, and it seems that the problem, as near as I can tell, historically, this problem originates with the Cold War and maybe the space race. And uh, in the 90s, it was less about beating the Russians or the Chinese uh, militarily, but it was very much about beating the Singaporeans uh, mathematically academically in order to beat them financially it was still a, it was still a cold war just a an economic cold war and now maybe it's both again and in that respect certainly from the kind of respect of kathy o'neill's book weapons of math destruction it's it's math that's held up as the thing that is in charge math is the authority that you cannot argue against and it takes someone with kathy's ability to point out that actually the emperor has no clothes with respect to all of this math but just some poor humanist like me who says actually i think the way you're doing education is all wrong i don't have any statistics to back this up philip um in fact i refuse i've talked to people and they said like well graham couldn't you do a study that that shows that the way you want to do education is actually uh, more effective than the way they want to do education and i say i guess i could but that you know you've lost the game right there yeah. if you're trying to win with with math but it seems to me that the principles you're talking about are also the solution if people understand that math is not within itself this cold hard systematic ahistorical absolutist way of thinking and being in the world yeah, I think that's uh, that's part of the problem. Um, I, would, I mean, in deference to the kind of extended moments that we're in since 2017, uh, calling into question the 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 certitude of of you know. Um, logical deduction or a fact, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have the ring that we really um, would like it to have. Um, but I think it's absolutely true. I think it's, and one of the, you know, the reason that I bring up the question of choosing your problem as a PhD student is if you're, if we're not allowed to at least admit that the questions we ask are going to be dependent on our attitudes, our aesthetics, our the meanings that we ascribe to the work that we do. Um, then, where else, right? I mean, it's like <laughs> it seems like at a minimum we should be able to admit that. Okay, maybe there is a sense of once the question has been stated, what progress means towards finding an answer. I actually don't believe that's the truth either yeah, but, me neither. <laughs> but but at least we should i think people should admit that the choice of the questions we ask 
um, is going to depend on society and our view of society. Um, this was something that I kind of, I, you know, I, it wasn't until after I think I finished my, my terminal degree, as they say, that I, I read this book by Jeff Schmidt, um, a physicist called Disciplined Minds about the professionalization um, of, you know, white collar work and, and, but it, it big, it's basically a, a memoir um, because the main case study is becoming a physicist. Uh, and there he, he shows in a way that I wished I could, but I really struggled to find ways to do in, in my book on mathematics. He shows how the notions that researchers have about pursuing their own curiosity, the way they talk about with their research programs, if you put those side by side with the way that the funding agencies describe the same <laughs> research, it's crystal clear why that research is happening and why it's being funded. But on the, but uh, it's kind of a tragedy that many of the graduate students, they are completely in the dark about what the social um, values that are being ascribed to their work is. Because the, the convention is you, you say what you're doing in this kind of nuts and bolts jargony way that obscures the, the applications um, or the programs that it's contributing to. So I guess one thing that this is taking us a little bit uh, away from math, but that that, that that comes up when you're talking about extended moments, and you talk about 2017. I mean, this is this is always the problem with with anarchism, or you know, more broadly, something like relativism, or you could even say it's freedom. Uh, Timothy Schneider, famously, you know, is the guy who is just like, you know, why we have dictators because we have lost capital T truth. And this is uh, certainly something that I, that I greatly, greatly resist. But it's a, it's a, right. it seems to me that this idea is, is a complete false prophet. Like, oh, if only people believed in the real and right things again, we wouldn't have Trump or whatever social ill it is. But of course, this is another way to describe this is make America great again, right? It's like, oh, back in the day, people believed yeah. the real things. And uh, reckoning with that, the, with the difficulty or impossibility of establishing those sort of eternal verities is precisely what my project is. But this is very unpopular when it seems to cut against the idea that you can, you know, use the right answers to fight the wrong people to get the good society. I mean, from, from just a purely political standpoint, the debate about vaccine mandates, you know, anarchists, people were just utterly befuddled. Regular people on the left were just utterly befuddled by the anarchist position that everyone should get vaccinated, but no one should be required to be vaccinated. In, in uh, American politics, as this is drawn up, this position makes, makes no sense. It's not even on the table. What do you mean something should be good, but also the government shouldn't be able to impose it? So that Again, that's taking us away from math, but that's the that's my answer to that problem. Is of course it's always dangerous. It's always dangerous to be saying, "Well, actually, it's not as easy as you think it is." Especially if there's a real easy, obvious villain out there who people want very easy answers um, to to use against. If that makes sense. Right. Right. Yeah, I think within mathematics. Um, the controversies that happen, it's hard to see them because they happen over longer timescales. Mm -hmm. I think in a moment to moment, if you and I were debating about the fact of the matter of something, say in you know this book about cubic equations, the, the expectation is that by the end of an hour or however long <laughs> we're going to sit and talk about it, one of us will be like, ah, okay, I, I see, you're right. And, and that's usually how things go in mathematics. Um, but those are usually questions about what's correct, not mm -hmm. about what's true. Yeah. And the distinction between the two, I find really helpful when thinking about, you know, what mathematics and art have in common and what they don't have in common. Because um, the, the kind of history of the idea of say, you know, what is a polyhedron in, in the, that book by Lakatos, um, if you are living through that history, 
there isn't a lot of discussion about what's correct and what's not correct. Mm -hmm. You know, usually that's the low bar to get something published. It has to be correct, at least, and not contradicting itself. But what is actually true is going to depend on what is interesting, what are, what are we confused about, what are we trying to understand, what are we trying to clarify? And that, you know, mathematicians can be really wrong about that. They can be really wrong. They can think they can be laboring under an idea that will be abandoned completely. Um, it doesn't mean that it, it's not, it doesn't mean that it's false anymore. It's strange, right? It, it doesn't mean that it's not correct. It just means that it was setting things up in a way that's, that's not getting the answers out of what we want for mathematics. And I think, you know, maybe that, that extends more broadly. I mean, I, I know you've talked about Thomas Kuhn before, um, on your show and you know this idea that when the paradigm shifts really you're entering a new world you mm -hmm. know you, you, what what was believed before is is really false um, and if you don't understand that if you think that it's actually just a little bit of a correction here and there mm -hmm. that that was always true all along that we've just you know we've found a way to state it more clearly right you're you're, you're not understanding the way science works according to Kuhn and I think Lakatosh as well yeah, and and me as well. But I mean, that's you know, Einstein says something like, you know, I'm just on a higher part of the mountain. You know, Einstein denies this Kuhnian way of thinking. He says, you know, I can just see a little more than Newton did, but it's the same valley. I personally am not. Personally, I'm not convinced by that. Um, yeah, I think that requires a really selective memory. <laughs> a, a, you know, a, an idea of history that that is not really concerned with what people were trying to do in the past and and how that's that changes over time. Yeah, well that is the I mean that is the great that is the great problem of historical understanding is that to understand history you must understand that people at a different moment had different standards for what is for what is true as you say. I mean another way of thinking about this I hadn't thought about this true versus correct distinction too much but it makes Perfect sense. One way of putting that in terms of what we've already understood and cut, I don't think I've covered Wittgenstein on this podcast yet. So I'm sorry, all of you listeners out there who have no idea who Wittgenstein is, and he's impossible to read. So I'm um, sorry about that. But you could argue that Tractatus is the most correct thing that was ever created by any human being. Um, and after he finished it, he essentially decided that it wasn't true. It, it, it had no value in that sense it was false even though it was correct and you get someone like aj air um who is coming after tractatus before the later wittgenstein is published and air will say things like you know the statement murder is wrong is you know neither uh correct nor incorrect it has absolutely no value and like you can see like oh this is this is the kind of statements that people think of as mathematical that are in fact going to pull you away from whatever it is that is why anyone would do math or philosophy in the first place. And it seems to have tortured Wittgenstein. It tortured him that he did this very mathematical philosophy that was perfectly correct. And when he was done, he he had nothing. He had nothing to, to hold on to. And getting people to understand that, I think, it would change our sense of what math and truth can be. I, Sorry, I, I guess right. I'm just yeah. No, no. I, I'm just thinking about. Um, I met uh, recently an artist, Paul Chan, who is also a publisher, and he published a translation of the only other book that that, as I understand, Wittgenstein published during his lifetime, which was a dictionary for children. <laughs> um, during the period he was teaching. Um, primary school in Austria, something like seven years, I think. Yeah, something like that. And uh, I find that really fascinating that that um, during these two completely incompatible philosophical eras of his his own work that that maybe somehow what contributes to the separation is is this experience of of conveying meaning building meaning um more broadly for for children but in particular in what are the words you should know um and maybe not should know but know how to spell or you know something <laughs> very modest you know um so yeah i think yeah. that's that's um 
that's a that's a bigger question for sure. I think um, that when you when you think about the role that that mathematics might have, you know, one of the questions that that I, I get stumped by is, you know, what is mathematics for? Um, <laughs> and for I think a lot of people's experiences, um, it's it's to sort of see how smart you are or something, you mm. know, or or how how you can confront um, logic and come away with it. Um, so so it's my turn to ramble a bit. But what I what I'm remembering what I wanted to say actually when you were discussing this this sort of historical and philo philosophical um, attitude about mathematics is that there's there is a big break that happens um, in the axiomatic method as I understand it once the existence of geometries that were not Euclidean uh, found a firm footing logically, um, you know, around the end of the 18th century, early 19th century, then there was a split that happened. And before, at least in, in the West with, with Euclid, it was understood that Euclid was doing two things that were seen to be inseparable. It was providing a, a program for logical deduction um, from, from facts that were assumed, whether they were assumed to be true or they were just set as ground rules, you know, doesn't, doesn't really matter. But, but back then that, the deductions that were obtained were believed to be true. Um, and so the method and the truth were seemed to be bound together. And once, once you get away from that idea and you have um, two versions of truth that are, um, that are not the same thing, um, they might be mutually constitutive um, and they might have a really interesting kind of relationship to one another, um, but they're they're definitely not the same thing. You know, the angle sum in a triangle adds up to 180 in one, and it does not add up to 180 in another. <laughs> then then you're forced to confront the issue of what are we doing? What, you know, what are we after with this? And that's something that you know I think if you're if you're going to go back into teaching and you're going to try to teach epistemology, I think that that's one of the places where <laughs> where um, you know it can be really um for students it can be very destabilizing in the best way good i'm gonna have to get uh, more more details uh on that on that from you um so we're running out of time i have one more question that i told my daughter i would ask you she's five but first i want to tell you a little story which is uh just that i i told a buddy of mine who teaches math about your book and uh he bought it and he said he just left it in like i don't know some lounge some sort of common area in the math building and he said the next day while he was teaching, one of his undergraduates walked in with the book in the middle of the lecture and was asking him questions about it. Like as he was up at the blackboard trying to teach because this student, Philip, was just so excited uh, to hold 99 variations that they could not even wait for their professor to be done teaching to ask him about. It. And I think my buddy said, I'm teaching, go away. But uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, I wanted you to know that story because that is the kind of that is the kind of effect that this book has. It's the effect it had on me. And I am talking about teaching. I'm I'm imagining ways to use it in my in my teaching. Uh, I'm I'm sure there's a way. I haven't figured it out yet, but I can imagine using it as as models and examples. Um, so just th thank you for this book. It's in it's incredibly exciting. Oh, I, I'm I'm very glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that that it's it's making some anarchists at least in the classroom and people who are willing <laughs> yes, to yes exactly to go against the uh, the usual <laughs> conventions. Now, now of, you know how to play the game. It's if if someone politics. is interrupting a lecture, it's anarchism. There you go. That's so right. everything is anarchism, isn't it? Wasn't that fun? Beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you. So the question for my daughter is: She looked at me this morning apropos of nothing and said, "Daddy, is infinity a number?" And I said, uh, "I'm going to ask." The person, the mathematician I'm talking to today, that question. So, is it oh, Wow, excellent. This is not an uncommon question in, in the, the five year olds' uh, circles. <laughs> um, well, these are the circles I run in these days, Philip. The five year old <laughs> yeah, circles, that's right. my life. Um, 
my sons are are still they get into some disputes about this um they're eight <laughs> eight and ten so you you don't have to settle on one answer right now you can you can keep refining it so so i guess you know we were talking about kindergarten you know what what's the right way to answer a question like that um i think it's to find out where the question's coming from mm. so there's i'll just i'll say two things about this. Is the question coming from the sense of number as ordering? Is it coming from, when I think about number, I think of that song in my head that goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera. Um, or, so that's one idea, right? I mean, people, this is called the ordinals, this notion of number. Or is it coming from another idea, which which I find more frightening? Uh, at least I did when I was a kid, um, and that's the the infinity that describes um, that I've got uh, one pen on my desk here, um, but I could have two. And if I'm in this classroom, maybe with students, then there would be 15, 16 pens in the room. Um, the notion of a of a quantity that's um that can be enumerated but is something that i put all together at once this so this is the the cardinal notion of of number and ask your daughter you know is that which of those questions is she interested in she might be interested in something completely different she <laughs> might be interested in a competition a game you yeah. know i want to come up with a the bigger number my friends are um or my enemies are saying that uh they can always come up with a bigger one by by uttering the words infinity and is that a, is that a, is that breaking the rules or not <laughs> right and each of those is is absolutely legitimate ways to think about quantity about number right um but they have different answers interestingly right so what the role that infinity plays in whether you're thinking about orders or you're thinking about quantity or you're thinking about a game um is going to have a different answer um and they're all interesting uh and you know you don't have to know the answer to have a conversation about it either. Yeah. well it's good because um, i don't know the answer but no that's I so mean, i hope this... i'm not i hope i'm not cheating by telling you that's no. that's how i would that's how i try to approach the when my well, would i mean Philip, this is me. this is precisely what we were supposed to be doing on this podcast right <laughs> i asked you a mathematical question and your answer was it's complicated. It depends. There's multiple different ways of thinking about it, and there is no right answer. And uh, and so, for all of you um, believers in mathematical determinist supremacy, that's the that's the answer for this podcast. And it's time to embrace mathematical anarchism. How does how does that sound for 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 a conclusion? I want a T-shirt with that. <laughs> I think it sounds good. Another line of T-shirts. It's time to embrace mathematical anarchism. That's the... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you so much, Philip. This has been such a pleasure. Uh, thank you. It's been my pleasure, Graham. <laughs>